how the theory of relativity plays into uh, engineering change. Uh, look at some sizing, uh, comparing different approaches to uh, our systems, uh, how you might uh, lay out and choose your own uh, integration project, uh, how to get prepared for that, uh, and what it finally looks like. So let's start with the uh, with the appetizer here. We'll look at the soup. We have a lot of different systems that we maybe uh, uh, run into. First one uh, that we most of us have heard of anyway is PDM, which stands for Product Data Management. Um, then PLM comes up a lot, which is Product Lifecycle Management. This one's a little odder. It, it does pop up from time to time. CRM, which would be Customer Relationship Management. And MRP, Material Requirements Planning. And finally, ERP, which is Enterprise Res Resource Planning. So we'll see some, some commonalities between some of these different types of uh, products. Right? The, the first three all have some sort of management as their grand title, uh, and they have some sort of data that they're uh, that they're managing. And the last two are planning tools. <clears throat> and that's kind of important because they're, they're typically the ones we're trying to connect to. And so we need to understand what's the difference between a planning tool and a management tool, and what's that mean when we try to exchange data between them. So we'll look at each one of these a little bit and, and talk about just some of the you know, kind of key characteristics and what's important to look at uh, in terms of uh, trying to connect them. So our PDM tools uh, then tend to be more uh, document uh, centric uh, and, and on a database. Uh, so at least the good ones are on a database. So if you have SQL or Oracle or MySQL or some sort of backend that's, uh, that's a relational database. Uh, the good ones will also have really good native CAD integrations. They create the most complex data and the complex sets of relationships. So, um, so it makes sense to have a, a PDM tool that understands that. If they're concerned with, you know, access control, version and revision control, what happened, you know, chain, documenting changes that happen to uh, to files as they uh, as they move through um, their usage. So, in terms of integrations, there are certain things that we want to look for. Uh, first, if if you don't have a PDM system and you're looking for one. Uh, whether it's for engineering or other things, the first thing that criteria that you're going to want to keep in mind is you want the one that supports your most important data uh, the best, right? So if SolidWorks is your key IP and that, you know, everything hinges around the integrity of that uh, SolidWorks uh, model and drawing data, then you want a PDM system that's best at managing SolidWorks, uh, you know, files. Um, and the same with any other tool, uh, you know, if, if you do circuit board design as your primary business, then you want this tool that works best for managing, you know, circuit board design. For data exchange, you want a well-documented API, right? And preferably one that has a broad um, support base of applications that are already written for it. And you know there's a, a good pool of people that know how to write software for it. There's already, uh, you know, plugins in place. Uh, there may even already be integrations out there. And then, preferably, an open API that doesn't require extra subscriptions, right? That's not a, a technical limitation, but it's certainly something that uh, you might consider, you know, if you're out there looking, shopping for a PDM product. When we then transition into PLM, right, the only thing that changes in the, the title of it is we, we switch from data to life cycles. But... On a broader basis, there's a different sort of architecture underneath it. It's still, you know, at its, its heart really defining uh, all the data around a product. But it becomes more item-centric. So the database has these central objects uh, that are items, and those items could be bombs. Some of them are very bomb-oriented. So the bomb is the item object, and it'll have things associated with it and uh, ways to control those, uh, those bomb documents. Uh, items could be documents that could be just a container that contains a bunch of other documents or a bunch of other items. Um, one thing that's, that tends to be unique about them is that processes will often be treated as an object, as an item in their database, rather than a fixed function um, that uh, of how something you know moves through a, 
a workflow, a workflow might be an item, an actual you know, object that is more of a template that, you know, I want to launch an ECO for this set of documents. So you fire up one of those and maybe you alter it a little bit in each instance so that it behaves slightly different for that particular application. Um, and so it's a little different than what we're, we may be accustomed to on a PDM side of, of how workflows and processes are, are integrated with the data. But they also tend to take on other uh, kind of broader uh, topics like suppliers and supply chain and uh, vendor relationships uh, can often uh, fall into that. And so we'll see as we look at some of the planning tools, they also have those types of uh, features built into it, but they may be looking at it from a slightly different uh, perspective than, than PLM. PLM is still product centric. Product is sort of the central uh, you know, <clears throat> theme of the database. Uh, and so everything kind of revolves around what the product is. Uh, you'll tend to see that uh, some of them are, are industry specific. Uh, they have various different modules or implementation plans depending on how, you know, what industry you're, you're uh, working in. They may ask you right up front, are you aerospace? Are you automotive? Are you defense? Are you apparel design? And these may have a significant impact on how it's, it's put together. So it often gets presented as sort of an envelope, uh, right? And whereas PDM is sort of a sub uh, component or a piece of the whole PLM picture. Um, and even others you'll see take an even broader approach to PLM as an overall solution and include things like CAD or technical publications and things like that, right? And that very, very well may be true. Um, for some of them, uh, we'll see that that that's how their their product uh, you know portfolio is put together. So things like uh, Dassault Systems and Novia, well, it's the PLM tool. You know, there's a whole you know, bigger picture uh, solution set that includes you know CAD, which is SolidWorks and CATIA and uh, 3D Via and all kinds of other <clears throat> different types of uh, applications that all kind of work around uh, the product definition. Uh, and we see that same kind of approach uh, from some of the other big. Uh, CAD and PLM uh, vendors for, you know, Siemens and PTC and Autodesk. But there is another sort of class, I should call it, of, of PLM tools that, that really aren't put together by the, the CAD data um, developers, uh, but instead kind of put themselves as sort of the glue that holds all these different systems together. Uh, and that's kind of how they'll tend to present themselves. So you may have a, a separate PDM system for electronics uh, versus software versus the mechanical design or even documents if you have a lot of legal sort of aspects of it. And those all need to, to come together into some area to, to more clearly define what the product is. Uh, and so that's a little different type of PLM system, but the same sort of architecture and, and idea, idea behind it. And some of those may be like your Aris innovators and your Arena Solutions and Key Techs and uh, I'm sure there's uh, others out there as well. <clears throat> so those are going to be, uh, you know, while their core architecture may be very similar to the other ones, uh, they're going to tend to have other features because they know they're going to need to pull from disparate systems uh, and get that data. So they might have a plugins directly to some CAD systems, or they might have plugins to PDM systems, uh, or they may just make sure they've got some uh, API and scripting available so that they can uh, do that because they, you know, that's a, a key part of how they're going to need to work. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on CRM, but just so you know what it is in case it pops up and uh, you know, anybody asks, <clears throat> if you're you know talking to your other departments, we use one here, uh, but it's really a customer relationship management tool. It's the database behind it is all customer centric, so everything it wraps around the, the customer. So what products do they have? What interactions have we had with them from a sales perspective or a support suspect, uh, perspective? Uh, so it gets heavily leveraged by marketing, sales, and finance. <clears throat> Uh, but we're typically not going to need to exchange much data with them. Uh, it's not really something that necessarily uh, impacts our product um, generally, but uh, just kind of be aware that uh, that those do exist. And sometimes the vendors do kind of cross different uh, realms, like NetSuite's the one we use. It also has ERP tool, uh, but it's certainly going to work differently than, uh, than the 
DRM uh, side of things. Uh, we don't manufacture anything, so it doesn't make sense for us to do ERP here. Uh, and Salesforce is probably the most commonly uh, uh, known name for uh, in that CRM space. MRP is the next one that comes up a lot. Uh, it's material requirements planning. So this is the first one of our planning tools. So under the you know key characteristics, the first thing we have to keep in mind is this thing is all planning centric. It's about um, you know times and dates and schedules. Uh, it's going to be concerned with things like manufacturing bombs, which are going to look very different often than our engineering bombs. They're more concerned with um, <clears throat> raw materials. You know when does when it, what's in the inventory? When's it going to come? What's the uh, you know lead times? Now, what does the bill of materials look like today for the people that are manufacturing it today? Right. So it's well on the PDM and the PLM side. There's a, a broad sense of history there where we can always go back in time and look at how something uh, you know appeared at any point. MRP systems aren't necessarily architected that way. There is a bill of materials that exists for today, and that's what we're concerned with today. Uh, and tomorrow it may be different depending on what type, what we've got in inventory or what's on the plan to build. Um, you know, and so it's, it's not as historically relevant. It's more, uh, more planning based, but they all, you know, involve purchasing and costing and production planning. So uh, definitely your, your, typically your finance departments and things like that are going to be uh, heavily involved with the ER or MRP tools. So if you, whether you're looking for one or you've already got one, again, if we're looking at, at this for, with an eye for integration uh, and you know, engineering change data going back and forth, we again want a, a well-documented API. We want to know, is, can we leverage it? Has it been leveraged? Are there third-party applications or, or even uh, first-party? Maybe they've got their own set of plugins and libraries available for, for it uh, that we can use uh, and leverage. And if we have to write something, you know, do we have to pay a special subscription to have access to that? So if we move on to ERP, uh, you know, it's similar in some ways to MRP. Um, it's a planning tool, again, at center, but it's enterprise resource planning, and enterprise resources can encompass a lot of things, right? from HR and manpower, right? All the people and their resources and their time uh, and salaries and things like that get factored in, uh, as well as some of the things we saw with MRP with the production planning uh, and manufacturing. Uh, so they're gonna have, you know, inventory controls and supply chain management, things like that all kind of integrated into, into their, their product portfolio. ERP tend to uh, kind of view themselves in a similar manner as uh, PLM systems where they're more of a, an ecosystem of applications <clears throat> that may include CRM or MRP. And in some of them, you'll even see they'll include PLM and PDM and, um, and things like that. Uh, now, whether they're the best fit for you as engineers using SolidWorks as your key tool, you know, that's, you know, that's a separate topic all, all itself. Um, you know, do they have that tight integration? Are they gold partners? Do they understand the SolidWorks development cycle and and all of that? You know, you know, we don't know. That's you know something. If you're looking for one, you need to to keep in mind if you're gonna uh, take on their their PDM uh, plugin to manage your uh, engineering uh, tools. Right. <clears throat> so as long as we we kind of understand the different tools that we're playing with and what their primary concerns are, right? With ERP and MRP, it's planning, right? It's planning centric, uh, PLM, PDM, right? Those are all uh, more product centric, right? And we can start to look at um, our engineering chain processes themselves. Uh, and so I put up this little, uh, you know, theory of relativity here where the success, you know, our effect Effectiveness is, is, is our ability to manage constant change. In engineering and product development, we know things change. Markets change. The um, regulations change. Right? The products need to, to get improved continuously sometimes. Uh, or sometimes it's not the products that change. It's our processes that change. Uh, maybe we do engineer to order. And so you don't doing the same product every time or modifying it. You're doing something different every time. But your product, your 
processes that you use to implement that process or, um, or you know, do those projects are, are what's changing. So if we're going to look at how we um, integrate, you know, the engineering change process across systems, then we have to start with a very pointed question and say, today, do your engineering change processes in each of those systems work well? Are they humming along? Everybody's, uh, you know, able to to do those changes the way they need to, and and our real bottleneck here is just the exchange of information when that happens. Right? So, if the answer is no, our system, we know our systems aren't quite optimized; they're not working quite like we would like them to. Then, we don't want to try to integrate them because that's not going to improve the situation. It's certainly going to make it worse. So, if that's where first place we're going to start. We're going to uh, to look at, you know, how are you going to man how are you managing your changes today? Let's improve that process. Uh, if you're using PDM, um, you know that's great. Um, what's the vehicle you use to those for those changes? Is it a document? Right? Is it a Word document or an Excel document? Is it a PDF document? Um, is that a deliverable? Do you have to send it to somebody outside the system? Um, does it need to get a historical version of it stored and uh, maintained for regulatory compliance? Or are you using that as your medium for data exchange? Like, so I'm going to put information into that engineering change form, and then I'm going to need to pull that information out of that form for somebody else. Right? That's kind of an important consideration if we're looking at exchanging information. Um, or is it really just a window into what's happening in that change? Right? It just shows me, uh, you know, the status of everything and what's being impacted and who's working on it. What's the details of that? Um, so if you don't have one already, I'm going to recommend that you at least consider XML as your as your engineering change kind of vehicle, as that the document you use to sort of track that. And there's some good reasons for that. Um, PDM Pro and Standard uh, use very data card variables uh, that are already know how to write into an XML file. So just like we use those variable uh, mappings to uh, to populate custom properties in SolidWorks that then propagate into the drawings and show up in bills of materials and title blocks, right? we can do something similar with XML. It's actually even more powerful in XML. Uh, it's just a kind of a glorified text file. There's sort of an example of a simple one there in the lower right. Some of the benefits that we get uh, for leveraging them for engineering change is that you get automatic content updates. If I change a variable on the data card, it changes inside the file. And if you look down there, something like, uh, you know, there's dimensions uh, listed here, right? So if this is a variable in my card and I change that, it changes here. Um, it's, there's no uh, macros required to do that. It's just inherent in how this, this operates, All right? Now, it's not very pretty. Um, but again, as just a sort of a, a almost a database sort of that's text based, uh, it gives us a lot of flexibility, right? Um, so much so that actually SolidWorks has put it into the PDM administration uh, curriculum uh, in the 2017 release. Another huge benefit we get over, say, using, say, a virtual document is that an XML file is actually printable. And the reason is that there's this little magic text file called an XSL, which is the style sheet. It does all this heavy lifting. Just like on your web pages, you've got HTML, which is the, the kind of the back end that contains all of the, the content. You'll have a style sheet, a CSS file that controls how it's, how it's viewed uh, and what it looks like. CS, or XSL does the same thing for our XML documents. Right. It allows you to, to format it the way you want so that when you're looking at it in the preview pane, uh, the preview pane is really just a glorified Internet Explorer browser window, um, in case you didn't know. Um, so this styles it to, to, to look a certain way when you're, you're viewing it, as well as printing it. But it, it can also do a lot more. Right? So if you need to reference images, you need to filter the data, right? Maybe we store a lot more in the XML than we necessarily need everywhere, but we're going to use it in different ways, right? The XSL can filter that and show only what's relevant. It can actually transform the data and change it into another format. 
Uh, and if you need to get really sophisticated, it can actually run code. So if you want to uh, do a lot more complex operations with the data stored in it, uh, you can. Right? Think of things like I'm attaching a whole bunch of files as a, as a reference to this ECO document XML file, and I need to have those listed in my XML or, or shown on the document when I print it. Right? So this XSL can, can run code to go pull that reference information and show that in there. Saves us needing to create a lot of variables on a data card to try to populate them in a different way. Right? It also saves us from needing to uh, say on a Word document or Excel to, accept, uh, <clears throat> to create macros uh, that need to run because the document needs to open so that the preview is out of date if we don't do that. You know things like that. It's a much cleaner, uh, quicker, and more flexible way of doing it. See some other reasons for this uh, this flexibility later on. So if your all your change processes are in good shape, right, you're happy with the way they work, now it's time to just connect them, all right, then we're in a different position. So now we can we would tend to try to ask questions like, well, when does the data need to exchange? What are the trigger points? Right? What data do we need to exchange? Right? And how do we want to validate them? Um, you know, that they were exchanged successfully. But I want to caution you that we might be running a little too fast if we do that. Uh, we will get to those questions because they're really important. Uh, but beforehand, we want to start and realize that not every integration uh, is going to be the same for everyone. So. And we want to first start with why are we automating this data, the exchange of information? Are we trying to reduce data entry? Do we have actual numbers where we can say we're People are spending, our people are spending 50,000 hours a year entering data uh, twice, right? Once into PDM, once into ERP when it's ready, right? Well, that's certainly a valid way, reason to, to automate, right? Are we just trying to reduce the data entry errors? We're getting a lot of typos and things because people are just so tired of typing, right? Or do we just feel that robots are better than humans, so we want to put the computer in the middle uh, to just take care of these things? But we also need to then ask, how is this going to impact our business? Uh, and there's some very real, you know, risks that are involved uh, with deep automations. Not every group necessarily uses the same processes. Even within engineering, you may have different types of business. You may have engineer to order, and you may have products that are, you know, been on the shelf for 20 years that you just do continual updates to and uh, continuous improvement. Um, but the processes you use to uh, to do those projects and to to document change and to implement change are very different. And would automating it hinder in either one of them uh, or prevent them from, from getting their job done? Are there areas of business you want to go into? Right? So you've got this vision of where you want to head. Um, would creating a deep uh, integration like this suddenly you know, make it more difficult to embrace new opportunities? Um, you know, and how does that fit in with the long-term vision, uh, both for your engineering department, your product development cycles, your products you're trying to get in, the markets you're trying to penetrate. So some very bu real business things that you need to think about uh, before we start to, to embrace, a, a, you know, some kind of a detailed process to integrate all of these, these systems. But let's say we've We've done that analysis. We've got a very solid case for, for needing to, to automate or wasting a lot of time entering data that shouldn't be. Um, do we want to go for fast, right, where we're very, very specialized? We can do one thing, but we can do it really, really well. Or do we need to be something more flexible, right, where we're not quite as fast, but we can go anywhere we need to go and do anything we need to do, um, you know, and adapt to a, a changing environment that we know is uh, is around us. Right. So the questions you might ask in that regard uh, to kind of plan for that are, are, are your processes fluid? Are you a startup and you're in your first year or two of business and uh, you know that you're disrupting the whole uh, market? You don't know what your processes are going to look like because you don't know how that market reaction is going to, to take. Right. So that's you're probably going to not want something super rigid. You know, and are you in a, a, a business like a you know, engineer to order uh, where you've, your success is dependent on your agility? Uh, and then, you know, like your long-term vision, 
Does the underlying logic, the business rules that that apply to these changes, do you see? How do you see that changing over over time? Has it changed already a lot, and do you see it changing more? Because that else could certainly impact how we architect uh, a um, an integration. And then a really important question is, do you have resources in, internally that can own it um, once it's in place? Right? Do they understand what's happening on both ends? Do they understand the rules that are happening in the middle? And to a, able to troubleshoot uh, when things go wrong, or if they just need to be able to adapt the system to changing uh, requirements. So what we see is that as we increase the, the level of system integration between all these disparate systems, the flexibility uh, tends to decrease. And that may be okay for the type of business that you're in uh, and the types of products that you design and the processes you implement. Um, but then again, it may be detrimental in other cases. So you just want to make sure that we balance what we're trying to do with an integration with what you're trying to accomplish as a, as a business. So now you've done all your business analysis. Now you're ready to, to kind of choose the adventure that you want to go on. So now we're going to come at you with some questions. And they're going to be similar to the things that we might have thought, thought we needed to get into before, like when does data get exchanged, right? What are the trigger points? Are they PDM workflows? Right? Does it happen multiple times within a workflow? Uh, is the trigger different or subtly different? Are the results different for each of those transitions? Um, are the chain are the is the data exchange triggered somewhere else like ERP or is there just a big red button somewhere that we that somebody in, initiates it manually? Uh, you know that's certainly a valid approach in some cases. And then we need to know what gets exchanged. Right? This can be uh, can vitally important depending on the you know the systems that we're uh, moving to the most common things that we exchange are, are bills of materials. Um, and within a bill of material exchange, it could be just uh, all the information about a single part. Um, are we are we uh, transitioning an entire bill of materials, like all the levels at once, or just a single level, which is kind of the most common for how ERP and MRP systems tends to show them? Um, or are we only pushing the bomb changes? Right? We have a recent engagement where that was the case. Uh, it was for SAP. And SAP only wants the, the delta, you know, what's added, what's removed, what's altered. So we need to be able to, to know how are we going to extract that information, how are we going to pass that on to the, to the other system. And then are there other deliverables that need to be uh, taken into account? Right? Are we publishing PDFs, uh, neutral formats like STEP, or STL for the rapid prototyping or even CAM files. Uh, that's more common in uh, exchanges with a PLM than it would be, say, with an ERP, but not uncommon for, you know, we may use PDFs specifically for ERP quite often because uh, purchasing may need to have that information to, to send out for quotes or you know, so on. So does the data that, um, that we're outputting, is it suitable for the destination or the target system? Right. Can ERP take the data that we're outputting natively and use it as it is? Um, or does it need to go through some sort of alterations? Or are there rules that, about how that data has to get imported? It's one that we've run into recently. You know, it's the question is, I can't upload a bomb until all the items in that bill of materials are in that system. Right? It'll just fail or throw back an error. So how we want to deal with those rules. Do we want to have multiple storage stages, one that just makes sure all the items are up and then the next one that updates the bombs? Right? Those are those are important considerations uh, when we're looking at uh, exchanging this information. And then one that's easy to overlook is how do we deal with failures? Right? You're writing software, right? There's all kinds of error handling that ha that is done in the code. Uh, and most of the time you don't see it and that's because the the Software engineer did a good job of do, dealing with all the error handling. Um, and sometimes you see warning messages that don't make any sense at all. Uh, but uh, you know, how do we deal with those on, in the case of an integration? Right? If uh, the export fails, what does that mean on the other end? Is that is this a stoppage? Do we need to hit the big red button and make everybody stop what they're doing? Do a code blue like they do at the airport, um, or do we need to send out emails so somebody can go see? Well, why did the export fail, or why did the import fail, or 
what happened with the rules in the middle. So let's look at, at some uh, ways we might prepare data on the PDM side for an export. Right. So we'll look at if we're taking to take an exchange engineering change data from PDM now to some other system like ERP or PLM. Right. If we're just starting with, with PDM Pro, one of the first things we'll tend to ask or look at is, do the built-in workflow triggered bomb exports work for you? Um, there's some certain benefits of using them. For one, they're XML format. We've already kind of talked about some of the benefits of that XML format. Right? We can do a lot with it. Even if it can't be used natively, we can use an XSL to make it fit uh, some other uh, out, uh, you know, output type. It's filled with its own built-in rules. And so we can output single level you know, items. Uh, we can output multi-level bills of materials. You can output single level bills of materials. You can do uh, configurations. There's a lot of uh, uh, options there. Uh, it's got alias mapping. So if the target systems properties are called something different than PDMs, that's handled already with through, through an alias mapping that's built into the, the architecture for that bomb export. And it's you know, relatively easy to implement and change, right? It's just a, a configuration uh, of your vault. It's not a customization. Um, and so its benefit there is that it's relatively low cost. It just costs you some time or either doing it yourself or, or with working with our uh, implementation team to implement it in the way that, that makes sense. But that may not fit everyone, right? So you may need a, a more, uh, a bigger option, maybe you want to add XBOM onto your PDM because you need extra bomb management uh, capabilities and you need that particular type of bill of materials to exchange the data. Number of reasons you may need to use XBOM. That's a, a product, you can see it on our website. We've uh, been work integral in the development of it. Um, so it allows you to add in the non-model parts, um, you know, reuse existing data, uh, merge different types of bombs together as kind of its own capabilities in that regard. And uh, if we do that, uh, and we've done that recently here for our, for someone. Um, we will all likely also create a task add-in that does a workflow triggered bomb output. We'll just be doing it from XBOM instead. We will most likely use an XML format for all the reasons we've already already mentioned. Um, and one of the benefits in XBOM is that it does a, it's a much easier for me to export the bomb changes if that's what's the critical component to what you need than it is from directly from PDM. It already has a great way of comparing, you know, between versions and revisions of a bill of materials. So I already know what's added, removed, and changed. I can pull that pretty easily into XML uh, for an output if that's the requirement. Uh, and again, it's on its back end, it's pretty easy to implement and change. Uh, the setup is not complicated. Um, it can help you, you know, do that within a couple hours. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, how do you need its data output? And then we may also then have to, you know, if that doesn't quite fit, we can do, you know, kind of more of a full custom sort of uh, development. We're still most likely going to leverage a workflow triggered bomb export, right? Just because it, it makes sense. It's connected to the, the workflow. It's really easy to implement. You can just tell whichever state you want to run this task. Uh, and then the tasks can be configured. They can also be scheduled so that they, if it's something that just needs to happen on a nightly basis, tasks have the capability of doing that too. So again, we're going to most likely leverage XML. We may not. If it's custom, we may do whatever it is that, uh, that you require, but that may be where we start. Um, uh, tasks are easy to implement, again, as we've mentioned. Um, but the caution here is that this may be a difficult thing to alter, right? Um, as far as altering the root code, because then you're going to have to come to us and we're going to have to redo the statement of work and, and look at how that changes. So if there's business rules that need to get coded into the into the integration, that's where you know things can get a little complicated, and it can it can kind of stall how uh, changes uh, need to get implemented. So it's just a consideration to take in mind. It may be absolutely worth it for you to do that, and then again, it may be too much of a liability to to go that route. So there may be a step kind of in the middle, right? We're going to call metamorphosis. <laughs> Where we're going to take the output data and 
we're going to um, do something with it. So we'll probably create another add-in, maybe a Windows service, just depends, right? So if we're triggering a bomb output, we'll use another task to then say, well, I knew I just output a bomb, so I'm going to go import that bill of materials. Again, that's why we would leverage the XML. We'll use these magic XSL transformation files to tell it what to do. And the reason we would do that is that putting that in the middle is super flexible. It lets you just go modify the XSL file. That file can be in the vault, just like your other documents. But it kind of becomes that, that gateway, that mapping that does that enforces the rules. Right? So it, somebody that's responsible for them can check it out, make the rules change, check it back in, and now it's live. Now when it outputs your XML, it does its thing and, and outputs it to other formats. And because the XSL does all the heavy lifting again, uh, it can output to different formats. It could go to an FTP. It could go launch DB queries. Um, it, you know, it could do any number of things. You know, with the raw uh, XML inf information. That's a, a a format that we actually have working in a production environment, um, or at least being tested and getting ready to deploy it into a production environment. So if you really want to see uh, that and kind of in action and how that works and what it looks like um, and see if that's relevant for you, then you know, by all means contact us. Uh, we'd be happy to, to set up a demo for it. Um, now, if we've output all this information, we've you know, transformed it and prepared it for the uh, for the destination system, now what happens, right? How do we get it into that system specifically? And there's not a simple answer for this, right? It's going to depend on all of these systems, right? So you have to find out, right? Does that system have an import utility? Does it just listen for files that show up in a certain directory and then it imports them? Right? Well, that's pretty easy way of, and uh, kind of a low impact way to do an in integration because then all we have to do is make sure that we're outputting the file into that location in the right format. And that's usually the best way, or the most uh, most flexible and, uh, and the least um, risky way to transfer data back and forth because then all the rules uh, and the you know, business logic is still contained within that destination system. You know, are there pre-existing third-party tools? Right. <clears throat> there are a couple of companies out there that make some already. Uh, I'd say we've kind of architected some uh, something of our own here, uh, but QBuild out in Toronto has a number of integrations to specific products. Uh, ATRsoft, who we partner to create uh, XBomb, has an ERP link product. There are Microsoft partners, so there's works with some of the Microsoft ERP tools already, um, and then they work a lot with Dusso. So uh, if they need to connect it to Anovia or something like that, then I'm certainly uh, able to do that. Uh, or, you know, if we have to engage the API for that prob uh, product, is it available? Right? Is there a subscription uh, that's uh, available for it? Does, or is it open? Um, and more importantly, you know, for long-term uh, maintenance and, and just, uh, you know, your own sanity, do you have somebody on staff that understands it? So that if something changes within your business rules or on the ERP side or the, the PDM side, they know, know what's happening with this integration uh, and can make tweaks to that API if they need to. Or do you just need to contact us and we need to you know, rescope it and look at what's different? Um, you still need to have people that own the process so they understand the whole uh, architecture, but um, you know, those are important things to consider. So my best advice is that if you've gone through all these questions, you've done the business analysis, you've figured out that you know you really need this, all of your internal systems are humming along, and now you're ready to do the integration, plan it in detail, right? Sit down with the crew, storyboard it, think about all the details. Um, what exactly are you exporting, and when's it getting exported, and, and what happens if that export fails? All those kinds of things. If you walk through that process of how you see the exchange happening, uh, it will do add a lot of benefits to, to the whole operation. For one, you're going to uncover areas that need improved. You're going to see where the data is not quite right, right. Is the data always look this way when it gets output or, you know, are we always pulling from the same type of information? You know, that's a, a big one. Um, 
are the processes reliable? Uh, it's going to help you all create, get a deeper understanding of the other business units and how you all play together, right? How the, all, everything kind of, you know, works uh, you know, in the end to, to run the business. Uh, and so that's going to be some, some important insight that you get gained out of that. It's also going to help define the success criteria of the implementation because you'll have it all outlined. You'll know what the expected outputs are. So if, you know, we're writing some code and the output doesn't meet what you've specified, then we, you know, we know there's, there's a problem now. Was it bad data coming in or is it how it got processed? Right? Those are all things that can then be investigated, but you've got a clearly defined set of criteria there to, to gauge the success, which is going to, in the end, streamline the whole quoting process, the development, testing, and deployment uh, on the back end. So after all of those warnings, you're still interested in doing a, an integration project, you know, we're happy to assist with that. Uh, by all means, contact us. Uh, you, you know, if you're just uh, kind of feeling the waters and want to get some sense, you know, you can certainly email us to the you know, info uh, email addresses, to either Hot Cruise this or Hawkware apps. Um, or you can certainly contact your account manager. They'd be happy to uh, to set up a call and chat with you about it and with us and uh, to kind of go over what you know what may be entailed. Uh, 